Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's town hall. My name is Missy Bryant, and I'm the Dean of Students. I've missed seeing all of you on campus, and I very much look forward to welcoming you back home this fall. I will be serving as your moderator for tonight's conversation. I would like to start by introducing our presenters for tonight, President Brock Blomberg, Mark Schneider, Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the College, and Shannon Zatola, Vice President and Dean for Enrollment Management. We will begin our time together this evening with remarks from President Blomberg and move into brief updates on room and board, what classes are going to look like in the fall, testing for COVID-19, the phased move-in process, the support and resources that will be available to you, and the draft guidelines for how we plan to live together on campus during the pandemic. After the brief presentation, we will begin taking your questions. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible, um, and we will continue to update our frequently asked questions on the website as the week continues. We will also have a recording of tonight's town hall available on the website um, by early next week. I'm going to turn things over to President uh, Blomberg to get us started. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Bryant, and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, I, the purpose of tonight's town hall is to provide a lot of answers, hopefully, to your questions. And so we'll be going through the steps that uh, Missy outlined. Uh, I just want to begin by making sure that you know that for us this semester, our number one priority is your safety and well-being. Uh, that is the key to what we're doing, and we've been doing a lot of planning with regards to that. So I want to thank our faculty and staff who have been so involved in that planning. And I think you'll see as the semester goes, there's been a, a lot of thoughtfulness put into this. I also want to say in order for this to be a successful semester, we're going to have to double down on our mission and our values. And our mission is that we want us to be thoughtful, responsible, um, and independent thinkers. And so what that means is in, in order for us to have a real successful year, every single one of us, uh, faculty, staff, and particularly students, are going to have to be really um, uh, responsible and thoughtful when it comes to all the issues of safety, to include social distancing, wearing masks, and, and all the like. Um, the other issue that's really going to be important for us this year are our values. Uh, and one of our most important values is that we need to be welcoming and inclusive. And so at a very uh, difficult time, it's important for all of us to, to double down on that point. Well, without further ado, I want to pass the mic over to our uh, Dean of Enrollment and Vice President, Shannon Zatol. Thanks, Brock. Hi, everyone. Welcome. As, as Brock said, I'm Shannon Zatola. Um, I oversee a few areas, including the admissions office and student financial services, which encompasses um, billing and financial aid. And so um, I want to talk for a, a minute about some room and board um, decisions. I know that that has uh, been a question that has come up and uh, fall bills have gone out. So I know that the Office of Student Financial Services has been very busy working with all of you, um, um, helping as to assist you through the billing process and the aid process uh, moving forward. So um, an important point that I think we need to make sure that everyone is clear on is that students are billed for room and board per semester not on a week by week basis. So our uh, approved 2020-2021 academic calendar dictates semester dates. So at this moment in time, we are planning on having a full semester for you. Um, certainly, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for things to change. As we know, 2020 has thrown a lot of curveballs our way. Um, and should the institution face significant disruption due to any kind of mandated campus closure or for um, safety reasons you know, related to COVID-19, any necessary room and board adjustments will be calculated on an individual student basis, um, depending on the amount of institutional aid awarded. And so again, at this moment in time, we're planning to have a full semester, which is why your bills indicate a, a full semester's worth of charges for the fall. Um, and anything that we face in the future um, in terms of significant disruptions will be dealt with at that time. And now I'd like to pass the mic over to Dean Schneider, VP for Academic Affairs and Dean of the College. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so as, uh, as you know, my, my title is Dean of the College and Vice President for Academic Affairs. However, I uh, 
over the past few months have also taken on the role of helping to lead our virus task force, which is a group that has been advisory to President Blomberg, as well as helping the rest of the campus uh, develop ways that we can deal with the coronavirus and uh, the threats of COVID-19. For us to be successful in the, in the fall, a gradual reopening will be essential. The, as we can see around the country, the notions to move too quickly to opening up uh, is one that can be a, a recipe for a rapid outbreak of COVID-19. That's something that we want to make sure does not happen on the Ursinus campus. So we have worked very deliberately to try to find out what is a way that makes sense with our curriculum to open slowly, to open with a limited number of students, yet really advance something that is consistent with our Ursinus Quest curriculum. Um, so it is on that basis that we decided to start with a uh, with bringing just the first year students to campus first um, and allowing them to have a condensed CIE experience in a format that is in which they're only taking that course for a period of about two and a half weeks. That timing turns out to be fortuitous also for the purposes of the coronavirus uh, and its attendant COVID-19 disease because that is about the incubation period of this disease, which gives us an opportunity to identify any cases on campus uh, and make sure that those uh, individuals are uh, isolated and allow us to make sure that the campus is healthy. Those, after those first uh, two and a half weeks of CIE, the campus then will return to what will be a regular length semester However, travel to and from the campus is something that is another vector of bringing disease onto the campus. So we've designed the semester to minimize the amount of travel to and from campus. So we will bring the U back to campus at early in September. And again, we want a first two weeks that are critical for identifying any cases that might come to campus. The, as most other institutions are doing, we also plan to, at this point, to move to remote instruction following Thanksgiving, as having uh, students go home and then come back to campus is very likely to bring COVID back to campus at a time in which we're also typically dealing with other seasonal diseases such as influenza. So as a result, we are planning right now to go to remote instruction, but courses are designed so that that transition will happen smoothly, it'll happen naturally. Those courses are also designed to allow students to engage remotely if and when they need to, either because they may be quarantined or they may have personal circumstances that make them more vulnerable to the, to the disease. Additionally, there are so many more details that I, I would take too much time to, to explain them to you, but you should be prepared that there will be novel spaces that will allow us to teach in ways that will allow us to maintain social distancing, uh, including having some classes outside under tents. Uh, it will be a, a truly interesting semester. So if we could go to the to the next slide. The, it's essential for us, if we're going to maintain the health of the campus, it's really important that we test students to make sure we know who has the virus. As many of you uh, no doubt know, a number of cases of COVID-19 are asymptomatic, but nevertheless can transfer the disease to others. So that's why we will test prior to your arrival on campus, but we're also planning ways, other ways to monitor the health of the campus after you arrive. Temperature checks, uh, symptom checks, and spot virus testing. Also, the testing options that are available nationally are changing rapidly, both in terms of availability and in terms of the actual technology. So we're following those very closely to be, uh, so that we can be as 
uh, effective in making sure that we maintain the health of the campus. Students and faculty are involved in this as well through a, a, a group called the Health Corps, and perhaps some of you here are already involved in that, in which there will be opportunities for students to not only learn more about the disease, but also be helpful in making sure that the campus stays as healthy as possible and doing contact tracing in instances in which somebody tests positive on campus. We, uh, uh, thus far, it appears that the comprehensive testing will be covered by individual insurance. The college, however, is also prepared to take on costs of testing during the semester if we need to. So we will make sure that we continue to have the testing that is necessary to keep the, the campus healthy. If we have cases that turn up positive to the coronavirus, those individuals will be isolate, isolated and their immediate contacts will be quarantined. If they're uh, students who live close to home, we'll encourage students to do that at home if that's uh, practical. And we also are finding spaces on campus for students for whom that is not practical. That's a, a brief overview of some of the plans that we have that uh, will make this semester both, um, both a, a truly interesting and unique semester, but then also one where we believe we can keep the campus a safe place to learn. This, many students would say, oh, I'm not sure about this because the, the situation is going to be so unusual, it's so different than what I would expect. And that, to me, is one of the primary reasons why this is an essential time to be in college in an environment like Ursinus, where you have the opportunity to really be working with thoughtful individuals who are trying to make sense out of the really complicated environment that we're living through, politically, health-wise, environmentally, uh, socially, racially, in all sorts of ways. This is a really critical time to be in a community in which all those sorts of things are being discussed and we're trying to make sense of them. I'm glad that you will be coming back to join us in the fall because this is gonna be probably the most important semester in many decades. At this point, let me turn it over to Dean Bryant who will talk a little bit about some of the aspects of student life on campus. Thank you. So I'm excited to share um, some information about your return to campus. I, I'm pretty sure most of you are as excited as we are. Um, we plan to announce the full move-in plan on July 15th by email, so be on the lookout for that. The plan will involve a phased move-in process. Uh, the early, there will be an early drop-off period for those of you who live within a two-hour radius of campus, but others may opt into that as well. Uh, the Institute for Student Success will continue to provide tutoring, advising support, and academic coaching, just as we did throughout the spring semester while doing that remotely at the time. Disability Services is also available to provide you with a space to discuss supports and accommodations available to you if you are concerned about returning to campus for classes um, for any kind of medical reasons please contact Disability Services if you need more information. Medical services will be provided by appointment only at the Wellness Center. Telehealth appointments will also be available. Counseling will continue um, with all current services, but most of them will be done remotely. We are also updating the Wellness Center with new flooring, furniture that can be wiped down, and by creating a separate area for students presenting with COVID-19 symptoms. All medical appointments, as I said, will be by appointment only. There will be a crisis response team member always available after hours if any emergency were to happen. So that's how we plan to handle any kind of after hours issues that may present themselves. As I mentioned in my email on Monday, we are committed to providing you with the best on-campus experience possible while also mitigating risk to the health and well-being of everyone on campus. While I know this will not be the same or sinus that you are used to, it will be a truly unique experience and we will get through it together. We've started to develop guidelines to help you protect yourself and your fellow bears. 
We are working closely with student government on how the guidelines are designed and implemented while also using guidance from the CDC, the state of Pennsylvania, and the Montgomery County Health Department. The guidelines are a living document and a draft, as you know, is, is available on the Bears Return website. We want to partner with you to explore ways to get the most out of our time on campus this fall. Please feel free to reach out to me or your student government president, Jalen Everett, with concerns or suggestions. I have to stress how important it is for us to think about protecting others during this pandemic. As bears, we must protect each other in order to maintain the on-campus experience for this semester and beyond. Two essential parts of protecting others are practicing physical distancing and properly wearing masks in public areas at all times. Many of you had questions about family units, I'm sure. We developed that idea so that you could socialize more freely, practice less physical distancing, and remove your masks. The idea behind family units is similar to how you might be living at home with your family during the pandemic. We know that during the housing selection process, the majority of you chose housing based on your friend groups, organizations, or athletic teams, and you see them as your sinus family. That is our starting point, and we will continue to solicit your feedback on how these family units will work. I also want to reassure you that you will be able to visit friends in other residence halls as long as you are physically distancing and wearing masks. I'm sure many of you are disappointed and maybe even angry that the guidelines will not allow for registered events this fall. And I totally get that. I want you to know that we put a lot of thought and time into how we could continue registered events. Unfortunately, every scenario we came up with posed too many risks to the health of our community. If you haven't seen our Director of Prevention and Advocacy, Katie Bean's video about how we came to this decision, please check it out on the Prevention and Advocacy website. Katie is also going to be sharing with you an EverFi course on mental health during COVID-19. It is a great resource and I very much recommend that you participate in the course when it comes to you via email. We understand the importance of having social connections and outlets, and we want to work with you to provide those outlets through more evening and weekend events that provide physically distanced interactions. We have to be flexible this semester, and that starts by understanding that no guests will be permitted on campus during the first two phases of our, of our return, the red and gold phases. When we move to the third and most normal portion of our return, the black phase, you will be able to have your family visit outside of your residence hall in a physically distanced manner. Flexibility is also going to be necessary when it comes to housing. Keep in mind that you may need to relocate during the semester. It will be easier to quarantine, isolate, and or begin remote learning if you're able to travel light. So please consider what you're planning to bring back to campus in August. While we want you to com be comfortable, we also want you to be thinking about what it might take if you needed to move on a, on a day's notice. So please pack only essential items. I'm sure we will get into more specifics on the evolving guidelines as we address your questions tonight. And the student affairs leadership team will be providing opportunities to engage in a more face-to-face -face way via Zoom about the guidelines in the next week or so. It is important to us that you and your family stay connected to the latest updates regarding the fall semester. I want to take a moment to highlight Mobile U, the principal way the college communicates the most important news and announcements to the entire Ursinus family. It has a lot of self-service features that many of you students have already been using to help you navigate courses and grades, but it has a lot of valuable information for your families as well. First and foremost is a campus safety tool, so make sure that you're exploring those details of the app as well. You can find the app for free in Apple's App Store or in Google Play. You just want to look up our sinus and the mobile U icon should pop up with the big U shield. Um, and you want to make sure to subscribe to push notifications so that you get all of those, all of those important messages. So we're going to move into your questions. Uh, we're going to do our best to get through as many as possible. You can submit your questions now um, by going to the box on your GoToMeeting panel. And I think we already have a question in the queue. Um, but I want to start by thanking the more than 350 people who have joined us tonight. So students and families, thank you for being here. Our first question is for Dean Schneider. 
what is the college planning to do to ensure researchers on campus can complete their projects? That's a, that's a great question. This is one in which um, uh, the fact that we will be able to be back on campus in, for in-person instruction will make a big difference in terms of those students who have laboratory-based projects. In, invariably, um, we have found that even in instances in which students had either lab-based elements of courses or many of our um, summer fellows projects were able to develop significant elements of them that were appropriate for remote work as well. So uh, we fully anticipate that students will be involved in research with faculty members in various different settings uh, from the fine arts to uh, it, it, in the sciences and that also, I'm completely confident in faculty that if we have a situation in which that gets interrupted either for an individual or for the campus for a period of time, that there will be opportunities to continue that in a meaningful way uh, and still maintain the health of the campus. Thank you. President Blomberg, as well as Dean Schneider, this question is for you. Uh, what data was used to make the decision for a modified school year and for canceling sports? So I'll, I'll begin a little bit, uh, just so everyone knows uh, how we're engaging in this. Decisions that we're looking at are looked at uh, a lot of research papers that are being done at various institutions, but we're also communicating with a lot of our sister institutions. So I have had a lot of conversations with the Centennial Conference presidents, regarding how they're thinking of their plans, uh, both in terms of the, the schedule for the year and athletics. And so when decisions are made on that, a lot of it is about sharing information. We actually have the benefit of having Johns Hopkins University as one of our fellow institutions in the Centennial Conference. And Johns Hopkins uh, has a, a, a special advantage in terms of really getting into the uh, underlying data and epidemiological issues and so that's been very informative so having those institutions as partner institutions and allowing us to look at a lot of the uh, data and studies that have been done other places has been really valuable I know Dean Schneider has been using that information uh, with the virus task force uh, they, they meet on a regular basis uh, to to talk about uh, things from high level to low level. So may, maybe Mark wants to add a little bit more to that as well. I, I think you really covered that that pretty well. I, I will only add that um, we made a real effort to try to put together the, the kind of relevant science, um, in particular the, the question of um, if we are going to phase the, the return to campus, what are logical ways within our curriculum that we can match the sort of two to three week period that's characteristic for the disease itself with um, our own curricular structure? And it was on that basis that we really made the decision that the CIE, the, the condensed CIE version, uh, is a logical way to do that. We also had the benefit that we there are a few institutions across the country that teach in that format and one of our faculty members uh, uh, Professor Mackler actually taught at one of those institutions and had experience in the, the sort of block format and was a great resource as we talked through the possibilities of doing this. We also have in, made sure that we've engaged a, a large number of of both faculty and professional staff on this campus who have relevant expertise spanning from uh, medical professionals to uh, folks with public health background to people with a basic biology background and and it's been uh, the the full virus task force has a membership that approaches about 40 so it really does include a large number of people on campus so that we have the opportunity to bring in those that multifaceted expertise that's necessary for making wise decisions. So Dean Schneider, is there an all virtual class option for students? 
Absolutely. If there are some students for whom they have uh, some sort of personal circumstances that may be their own circumstances or have to do with other family members that make them particularly at risk for this, we are prepared so that they are, will be able to engage with whatever courses they are involved in in a virtual format. That even includes, uh, for example, some chemistry laboratories to, to say, well, we, the, the chemists anticipate there will be uh, a sufficient sized group of people that may need to engage that way so that they uh, can designate a purely remote section that will not have the benefit of the hands-on experience, but will nevertheless uh, learn the same sort of um, of chemical uh, principles and have the opportunity for doing similar sort of analyses. So we're trying to deal with this as, as flexibly as possible, both for students who feel long-term that they don't have that uh, capability of, of engaging in person, and as well as for those folks for whom they may be exposed to the disease and we need to keep them quarantined for a period until we know that they're healthy. Thank you. President Blomberg, why is tuition and room and board increasing while students will have less options for food and be on campus less? So the decisions on the increase for room and board and tuition are to try to keep our prices in line with inflation. Um, we have a generous financial aid policy. So for most people, while you see the headline number as being really big, actually the amount that we're in, uh, providing in terms of aid is actually even bigger. So we're actually providing even more resources to students on a student by student basis, but we're keeping the headline number higher because we believe that uh, that is actually indicative of the quality of education that we have here. Uh, we believe that that price indicates quality, but we do understand for a lot of people that during these times there might be more needs and that's why our financial aid budget has actually increased even higher than that. Thank you. So we have received over 50 questions already and we're doing our best to get to as many as we can. Um, so we'll move into the next one and Shannon, I'm hoping you can help with this one. Is a student able to keep their scholarship if they choose to not enroll until the spring semester? Absolutely, so a student scholarship does remain intact. Um, so that includes your merit, your need-based, um, as well as any of the specialty scholarships you may have been awarded um, right through spring. If you decide to, um, you know, take a leave further than that, things may change with your need-based aid depending on what your financial situation is. That could work in your benefit, or if you have an increase in your um, your financial situation, uh, we may need to reevaluate. But absolutely, and if you ever have any questions. Uh, Deeper, at a deeper level than that, I strongly encourage you to contact the Office of Student Financial Services via phone or um, email. And at this point, they've opened for appointment um, appointments on campus as well. And they can certainly talk you through any questions you have. Thank you. Dean Schneider, there are a couple of questions coming up about COVID-19 testing. Um, a couple are right here, so two-part question for you. Will the student insurance plan cover coronavirus testing? Actually, three-part question, sorry. <laughs> Let me take notes. <laughs> <laughs> Will the student insurance plan cover coronavirus testing and what type of test is required for COVID-19? Is it just a cotton swab or is it an antibody test that would be required? Okay, um, so our our experience thus far is that virtually all insurance plans cover the uh, the test without a deductible. So we want to make sure that there's no additional cost to, to uh, students and their families. Uh, if there are at the all of the situations relating to testing uh, are varying on a rapid basis. So we're trying to keep ourselves in touch with that. And in fact, we are using the same sort of protocol for faculty and staff who are coming back to campus over the summer so that we will gain our own experience internally 
to make sure that we know how these processes work. The test that we're interested in is the one that tells us whether someone has an active infection or not. And those, uh, the ones that we will have before people come to campus are the PCR tests. It's a, it's a swab test. Right now, these are typically done as a nasal swab, although there are some tests that are done as a, a, in the, a swab inside the mouth. But it's, it's not a difficult test, and, um, and that's something that we want to make sure that people have as close as possible before coming back to campus. We, we're in the process of putting, up, putting together a, a full protocol for how we want folks to be able to accomplish that. We recognize there may be some special instances, special needs that individuals might have depending on their particular plans and availability, and we're uh, eager to work with people on an individual basis to make sure that everyone gets tested so that we know the health of the campus from the very beginning. So this next question I can take. Um, the question is, how will traditional social events like Rush Week for Greek organizations continue and be adapted? And I think that's a great question. Uh, Dean McKinney is working through um, several different options and will be working with IGC to figure out what the best options are. Obviously, we know that being able to do new member education is important to those organizations and re the recruitment period is so essential for that. Um, and Dean McKinney will be working hard to figure out what those options will be. Um, and as soon as that information is available, we'll make sure to communicate it to everyone. Dean Schneider, there's another one for you. Uh, is there a plan in place for commuting students? We, we have just been working through the question of what we will do uh, for commuter students. We have recently affirmed that we want to make sure that our commuter students still are able to participate uh, in in-person classes. It is something in which we also recognize that that provides some extra risk for the campus as well because those are individuals who will be traveling back and forth. We want to, again, make sure that we're able to work individually with uh, those students to understand the particular situations that they're in if they're at higher risk for communicating the, the disease to campus. We may uh, introduce a, a more frequent testing of them so that we are um, all aware of what might be happening to them in individually. We also want to make sure that there are places for them to uh, work and study while they are on campus that will keep them relatively uh, isolated from the rest of the campus, although still feeling like very much they're part of the campus. Again, we want to do things that move things in the right direction without um, sacrificing the, the full experience of being on campus. In a similar vein, um, I think you might be able to answer this question. Will students be able to have off-campus jobs this semester? That's that's another great question, and it's a it's a really tricky one. It's one in which we will, again, encourage. In general, we're going to discourage travel from campus that is not essential. We recognize, however, that for some students, being able to come to campus absolutely depends on employment that they can get off campus. If that's the case for individual students, we'd like to work with them to be able, to, again, to make sure that we're able to evaluate the risk of the kind of uh, travel that they have to do back and forth, the character of the work that they're involved in, and see if we can establish plans that help make sure that they are as safe as possible and that it diminishes the likelihood of bringing the disease to campus. And again, that may, uh, include making sure that they have adequate uh, supplies for um, their personal protection and also uh, potentially having an enhanced testing frequency for them as well. Thank you. So the next question is a student affairs question. Uh, will we be allowed to choose who is in our family unit or will it be chosen for us? 
Um, and again, this is something that is still fluid. Um, what we're thinking right now, um, as I said, is that in many ways you may have already chosen your family unit without even knowing it by selecting your housing for this fall semester. We're looking at creating family units based around um, community bathrooms or common restrooms. So for instance, a Reimert suite potentially could be a family unit. Um, a particular floor um, in New Hall may end up being a family unit. A house on Main Street could be a family unit. So those are all the options that we're exploring, um, but we're certainly open to ideas that you all have as well. So please, as I said, don't hesitate to reach out to me or someone else on the student affairs team or to Jalen. Um, he's working very closely with us to, to do our best to make this the best possible experience for all of you. So certainly if you have ideas, please let us know. Another one for me. Uh, will our family members be allowed to come into our residence halls during move-in and move-out? Um, certainly during the move-in process, there will be some ability to bring a family member or someone else with you to help you move in. Um, as far as move out at this point, I think it, it's hard to say. Um, if we are in a good place in terms of the virus being controlled and being isolated from our campus, it's possible that during move out, you may be able to have uh, your family members helping you. But certainly at the start of the semester, part of the reason for our phase move in approach is to limit the number of people in buildings. Um, and so certainly if you need to bring someone with you, that's part of the reason why we're doing that. Um, so you definitely will be able to have help with move in and we're taking it day by day with the move out process at this point. So Dean Schneider, there are a lot of questions about dining. Um, can you provide some insight into dining in Wisner? Sure. Um, we're working very closely with Sodexo, which is our outsourced dining provider. Um, Sodexo is an international company. Sodexo uh, has had um, dining facilities, uh, not only at colleges and universities, but also in uh, a variety of different kinds of businesses, including hospitals, including in fact, a hospital in Wuhan, China. So they're a company with a deep set of expertise in terms of how to manage food services in the context of uh, the global pandemic. So we're fortunate to have them as our partners for dining. We recently, I recently uh, had a chance to meet with some of the, uh, our Sodexo leaders on campus here, as well as the uh, Montgomery County Public Health Authorities and go through some of the plans uh, for Wismer in which the much of this has to do with with making sure that traffic is designed so that one can maintain um, physical distancing between individual students, making sure that there is not a passing of plates back and forth from the serving area to students so that it's only a one-way traffic and to then make sure that seating is such that uh, individuals are at uh, at least six feet apart from one another. And our plans at this point look like they that we should be able to accomplish that fairly readily. We will need to do some things such as extending hours in the dining hall. We also will benefit from gaining the experience of the CIE uh, couple of weeks at the beginning in which we make sure that the actual demands on dining are relatively low at that point. We also are uh, making sure that there are very active opportunities for takeout dining as well. And if the campus gets in a situation in which uh, we find that there are multiple cases on campus, we have the ability then to move to, to strictly uh, take out dining so that we are not having a situation in which we are having to seat people at, at tables around from one another. So we have the flexibility there and we have a strong partner in this process. So I'm th that is certainly going to be one of the challenging areas, but I'm feeling quite optimistic about our ability to handle that. And certainly Sodexo says that their record around the world in these sorts of situations has been extremely strong. So um, we're, we're very optimistic. And another question for you. 
Will individuals from the community that are non-students be allowed to enter the campus? And if so, will they be required to wear a mask? As an example of this, will people in the neighborhood be able to walk their dog daily? Um, that, that's, uh, that's a great question. We are, I mean, we've talked a great deal about this. Clearly, the Ursinus campus is not one that is, uh, it's not a fenced in campus and in fact has pieces of it that go immediately into the surrounding neighborhood with, with uh, college buildings on both sides of Main Street. So the notion of being able to somehow exclude the uh, Collegeville community from the campus is essentially impossible. That said, we do want to encourage the, the wearing of masks on campus. We will be doing that by setting our own example for that. We will be setting this also through communication to the, the local community as well. And we're already looking at ways in which we can have opportunities to interact with local authorities. We also recognize that the, our ability to enforce this is not going to be perfect. We don't want to be uh, spending all of our time uh, chasing somebody who happens to be walking their dog at six in the morning when really there's no one else on campus. So we're going to attempt to be um, both reasonable but also uh, assertive that that's our expectation of what happens on campus. Perhaps more important than people who may happen to be outside where the probabilities of transmission of disease are, are very low is the question of whether we will have events on campus that will be bringing people from the outside community onto campus. And for the foreseeable future, the answer to that is no. Certainly during the, uh, the old gold phase that, uh, that Dean Bryant was describing, that's a, a situation in which we want to be as, as cautious as we reasonably can on campus while maintaining in-person uh, interactions among students and, and faculty. So in that instance, we will be wanting to make sure that we are not uh, bringing folks from the outside to campus. Of course, that, that we do part of a critical part of our job is making sure that not only the, all the students who are on campus are getting a good experience, but we also wanna be preparing for the future as well. So this means we are working very carefully to make sure that we can continue to recruit uh, prospective students for the class of 2025 and beyond um, in ways that give them an opportunity to understand what the campus is without having a strong communication between them and students on campus to the extent that, that we can avoid that. All of these things are, are in our planning so that we're trying to make this as safe as possible and continue to do our essential function. So President Blomberg and, and, and Shannon, um, we're getting a lot of questions seeking clarification about room and board. Um, if a student chooses to do the semester remotely, how does that affect room and board? Um, and what about financial aid implications? Well, sure. I don't know. you want to go first? Why don't you go first, Shannon? <laughs> okay, sure. So if a student who is um, currently, their status is a resident student, if they decide that they're going to uh, participate in the semester virtually and reside at home or with a family member as a commuter, um, certainly that's an option. There are financial aid implications for that. The, um, their package, their financial aid package will need to be reevaluated because that's a significant change to their overall cost of attendance. And packages are determined based on overall cost of attendance. So it's certainly an option, but um, they, they will need to connect with the Office of Student Financial Services, and I believe Missy, um, a, a staff member in your area, to talk about that as well. So there are implications, but it is certainly possible. I don't have anything really to add to Shannon's answer, but I just want everyone to know that one of the things that is going into all this plan is we're trying to be as flexible as possible, and I think that's one of the things that we have an advantage um, because we are so small and nimble and everyone's working on that. And we're trying to be in, as individualized as possible. So when questions for specific individuals come up about room and board or about classes that you're taking or about specific 
um, you know, um, organizations and, and how they move. We're trying as best as we can to be flexible, to allow for as much of that college experience as we can. I think uh, Dean Snyder really made a, a really important point. This, if you were to think uh, of, of a time to be in college, this is really going to be an important semester. It's an election year. There's a lot of important social justice actions that are going on. We have a pandemic. Uh, plus, there's a lot of important learning that can be done. And so this is really an important uh, time for this kind of experience. And we want to be able to provide all of our um, student experiences, whether it's through residence life or, 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 or through the classroom, in as flexible and as individualized as we can. Thank you. There are some questions coming in about the red, old gold, and black phases that we mentioned tonight. Um, they're on our Bears Return website, just so everyone knows, but perhaps Dean Schneider, you could clarify what the phases mean for us. Sure. The, um, if you look on the Bears Return website, you'll see actually there, there is a, a profusion of different phases there depending on um, what particular cycle of the, the year we're in. And they're not meant to necessarily be sequential, but the, the, certainly the, those, the three colors to try to make this as simple as possible. The, the red phase is one that really sort of characterizes the, the mode of operation that we had in the second half of the spring semester of this year. That is that really all of the instruction has gone remote, the campus is, is largely empty, and uh, that, that minimizes any chance of disease uh, transmission. Um, the old gold phase, this is the one that corresponds to the transition periods that uh, we had referred to in, in a couple instances, the, the time that the, the first year students will be on campus by themselves doing the, the condensed CIE, and the first couple weeks or so of the arrival of you returning students to campus as we try to make sure that the campus is as healthy as possible. If we become uh, adequately convinced that we really have the, the health of the campus under control and that those few students and faculty and staff who are coming back and forth to campus are doing so in a way that maintains the health of the campus, then we'll be able to move into the black phase, which will allow us to relax a little bit on some of the constraints that we have. And mostly that would involve some things that, that have to do with uh, restrictions on the size of gatherings um, and uh, may also allow us to be a little more flexible in a uh, dining situation, in some of the other group activities and some of the things that athletics uh, and recreation and fitness would be able to engage in. So various aspects of the campus are all thinking about, well, if we are in one of these different phases, what does that mean for our operation here? And one, one real important point that, that Dean Schneider always makes is how important the old gold phase really is. Because we need to be able to ensure uh, our safety and well-being and we, if you want to have some more relaxed opportunities, we have to make sure that everything's handled uh, at, at the highest level, that we've tested and we've contact traced and we have everything under control. And so during those first couple weeks that you're on campus and the first couple weeks that our first years are on campus, that's going to be a critical time for us to be able to have a real successful semester in terms of our ability to be residential. So I just want to highlight that in terms of the phases, if there's one phase that we really want to concentrate on, it is that old gold phase. Thank you. And Dean Schneider, another question for you. Could you describe the protocol if someone tests positive for COVID-19 on campus? Sure. Um, so if someone tests positive for campus, the the first thing that we want to do is to isolate them from the rest of campus. So we will decide um, in discussion with them whether that is something that will happen at their own home or if that's not practical, it, uh, where we, we have set aside some spaces on campus so that we can also 
put students into isolation on campus. And in any event, they will still be uh, able to engage with the uh, with their various courses through uh, remote work. It, under most circumstances, for most 18 to 22 year olds, the, the actual health implications of COVID-19 are relatively minor. We of course want to have a really careful eye on this because that's not universal by any means. So we will wanna make sure that they get um, self-care instructions from wellness and that we keep close contact with them to monitor their health and progress so that if they need additional medical attention that we can make sure that that happens. Um, additionally, we will uh, engage in contact tracing with those individuals to find out uh, who are the people that they have been in close contact with uh, particularly over the preceding two days. Those are the, that's the time during which they are um, most, um, that, that they will, are, are able to transmit the disease. It's also a time that generally precedes the symptoms of the disease as well. That, that the sort of standard definition now of someone who's a close contact is someone with whom you have been closer than six feet for a period, a continuous period exceeding 15 minutes. Um, we have a group of students and faculty who are in the process of actually training to become contact tracers and they will be working in collaboration with the public health authorities in Montgomery uh, County who will help us make sure that we do a thorough job of identifying students who were those close contacts. Those students will be quarantined for a two-week period. Um, and again, those we will have the option of either uh, encouraging them to be home during that time and engaging remotely in their classes, or um, if that's not practical, we will have uh, some spaces on campus for this. That um, the this will also then be. Uh, coupled for those students who are, are in quarantine, we want to make sure that also not only do they not develop symptoms over that period of time, but we also want to make sure that they test negative for the disease before we release them from quarantine and allow them to rejoin the rest of the campus. As you can tell, this is a somewhat, uh, this is definitely a disruptive kind of event. This is why it's so very important for the full experience of the campus, just as President Blomberg said, for us to make sure that we are all taking that old gold phase as absolutely seriously as possible, because we wanna make sure that we maintain a, um, a healthy campus with as few disruptions as possible. Thank you. The next few questions are related to residence life, so I'll jump in here. Um, the first two questions are related. Um, can you describe what shared spaces will look like and will students be able to study together outside of their dorms? Um, so one thing that in student affairs we're really committed to is making sure that we preserve common and shared space for students to be able to gather. Um, but we have to make sure that we're doing it in a responsible way. So again, maintaining the physical distance that's required of six feet and wearing masks. Um, so that is gonna be an important component. Additionally, you will be able to study together outside. Certainly you can use um, the Adirondack chairs, our beautiful campus, the tents that are gonna be lit um, on campus outdoors, as well as obviously the IDC, the library, all the same places you usually use, it's just gonna require us to be responsible and working together to make sure that we're doing the right thing in terms of physical distancing and wearing masks. Um, so definitely we want to preserve that. A related question came up, which is a really good one. How do I protect myself from a roommate inviting other people into our room? Um, and as you all know, we do a roommate agreement at the start of the semester, and we will do that again this year. And this is gonna be an important component of it. How do you feel about me inviting someone to our room? How do you feel about having a guest 
um, from another residence hall in our room. Um, keeping in mind that the only way you can do that is if you're maintaining physical distance and if you're wearing a mask. Um, but that will be part of the roommate agreement conversation. And obviously, if there um, is any issue with someone not keeping up their end of the bargain with that agreement, um, you would work with Residence Life to work out some sort of compromise or alternative um, that is gonna work for both you and your roommate. Oh, another one for me, it looks like. Um, what happens if students do not follow the guidelines? You know, I'm just gonna be really honest. If we are not following the guidelines, it's not likely that we'll be able to remain residential for the fall semester. Um, we really, I mean, that that's the worst possible consequence, obviously. And so we want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, the guidelines, as I'm sure you've read in my email, will be considered part of the student handbook. And so violating them could be considered a failure to comply under the code of conduct and would be handled as such. Um, certainly, I hope that doesn't happen. We're gonna be doing a lot of prevention work on the front end. Um, so thinking about um, helping everyone to understand the importance of all of the guidelines we're providing is gonna be an essential part of our return. You're gonna to start to see some social media campaigns around that before you return to campus, as well as when you're on campus. Um, and we're gonna continue these conversations. Um, and I think it's important that every, everyone recognizes the importance of really sticking to the guidelines. Um, it's gonna be essential for our success this semester. Um, it looks like we only have a few minutes left. A question for Dean Schneider. Um, can students start in a traditional face-to-face -face learning situation and then switch to virtual during the course of the semester? This, this certainly uh, can happen if someone uh, ends up being quarantined. So there certainly is a possibility there. The, the, the question of whether a someone might want to actually move to this and, and say, well, I'm not sure I want to be on campus anymore is a more complicated situation with dimensions that have to do with the residence life situation, that have to do with their the, their financial situation. There, there are many different aspects to that. Um, but certainly in terms of the flexibility of being able to do that for a given course, um, this is something that we are building in in a universal way across the the curriculum. So, so from that point of view, from the academic point of view, it certainly is possible. Thank you. And unfortunately, it looks like we're out of time. Um, and while we couldn't get to all of your questions, this will not be the last opportunity. Certainly, we will continue these conversations. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to have an opportunity to engage with the student affairs leadership team um, in a more face-to-face -face way via Zoom opportunities coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, additionally, we will try to address all of the questions that came in on our frequently asked questions page over the course of the next several days. So be sure to be checking the Bears Return website. We will also post this town hall um, on that site if you want to come back and, and re-listen to it or tell your friends um, to check it out. And it looks like President Blomberg has one more thing to say. I just want to make sure we thought we might get some questions on athletics. I uh, want to make sure you know there will be an, a town hall specifically about athletics. I believe it's the 23rd at 7 p.m. So I'm sure there's lots of questions there. and We'll try to answer those at that point. I think you were reading someone's mind, President Blomberg, because I just have a little note that says we're getting a lot of questions about athletics. So thank you. Yes, I want to point you all to the athletics town hall. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. We really are super excited to have you back on campus and our success is dependent on all of us and on all of you. So thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Take care.